Want to master grammar so you can speak properly, express yourself better, and understand more? In this video, I'll show you how to master grammar with our lessons and learning program. Let's begin. Number one, listen to the lesson conversations and explanations. In every lesson, you learn a conversation. Then, our teachers break down every word and grammar rule. So you're actually learning grammar rules in the context of conversations, and you can easily see how they're used. Once you're done, review the conversation again and again to remember what you've learned. Number two, read the bonus explanations and tutorials. With the lesson notes, you get extra grammar explanations and examples that are not presented in the lesson. After you're done with the lesson, read the lesson notes for extra review. You can even save them as PDFs so that you can access them anytime. Number three, leave a comment on the lesson. Once you've learned a grammar point, be sure to use it. Leave a comment in the comment section. Write some example sentences for practice. Our teachers will review your comment and give you feedback. Number four, unlock even more grammar lessons. If you want to find all of the grammar lessons available, visit our lesson library. Under category, choose grammar. You'll get all of the pathways and lessons dedicated to helping you learn and master sentence patterns and grammar points. So, if you're ready to finally learn a new language the fast, fun, and easy way, sign up for your free lifetime account by clicking on the link in the description. Signing up takes less than 30 seconds, and you'll start speaking from your very first lesson. If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share it with anyone who's trying to learn a new language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. I'll see you next time. Bye! Hi, welcome to Introduction to Spanish. My name is Alicia, and I'm joined by... Hi everyone, I'm Leah. In this lesson, you'll learn the basics of Spanish grammar. Word order refers to the order in which words are structured to form a sentence in a given language. Consider the English sentence, I read books. If we break down the English sentence, I read books, we can see that the subject, I, is presented first, followed by the verb, read, and then finally the object, books, is positioned last. The basic word order for English, then, is subject, verb, object, or SVO for short. Now, let's compare that same sentence, I read books, in Spanish. Yo leo libros. If we break down the Spanish sentence, we get the subject, yo, meaning I, then comes the verb, leo, meaning read, and finally we have the object, libros, meaning books. The word order for basic Spanish, then, is subject, verb, object or SVO for short. As you can see, the word order for sentences in Spanish is the same as that of English. This means that you can essentially swap out English words for Spanish words in an English sentence to convert it to Spanish. So imagine you wanted to say, I ate an apple, but in Spanish. Just swap out the words. I in Spanish is yo. Ate in Spanish is comí. An is una. And apple is manzana. Altogether, it's Yo comí una manzana. So, I ate an apple in Spanish is... Yo comí una manzana. You can form nearly all basic sentences in Spanish just by following the SVO word order. We just saw how easy it was to form basic sentences in Spanish and how similar it was to forming basic English sentences. Luckily, it's actually even easier to form sentences in Spanish than it is in English. That's because Spanish is much more flexible when it comes to word order compared to English. Let's go back to the two examples we used earlier. More often than not, if we wanted to say, I read books and I ate an apple in Spanish, we would not usually say, Yo leo libros. Yo comí una manzana. But instead, we would just say, Leo libros. Comí una manzana. Notice how the subject I is omitted from the sentence. This is how most Spanish sentences are constructed and spoken in real life. When it's clear who or what the subject is, most Spanish speakers would omit the subject altogether. Yo leo libros and yo comí una manzana would only be used if the subject is unclear or if you wanted to place a stronger emphasis on the subject, as if to say, I am the one who reads books, or I was the one who ate the apple. So, most of the time, we can actually express any simple action in Spanish with just two words, the verb and the object in Spanish. 
So far, we've only looked at affirmative sentences in Spanish. But what if you wanted to make the sentence negative? Well, that's very easy as well. All you have to do is just add no before the verb and that's it. So, I don't read books would be... No leo libros. Same thing for I didn't eat an apple. Just add no before the verb. No comí una manzana. And that's all there is to it. Once again, it's much simpler to form questions in Spanish than it is in English. There's actually a variety of different methods of forming a question in Spanish. Let's go through some of them. We'll seem a little strange if we ask our own selves a question in Spanish. So let's introduce a new subject. Let's go with Juan, a very typical Spanish name. So instead of I read books, we now have Juan reads books. Juan lee libros. The simplest way we can turn that statement into a question is by just raising our intonation at the end of the sentence. Juan lee libros? Meaning, does Juan read books? In conversation, we just need to raise the intonation at the end to express that it's a question. In writing, however, we have to include the question mark at the end, just like in English. But unlike English, questions in Spanish are marked with an inverted question mark at the beginning of the question as well. Juan lee libros? Another simple way we can turn a statement into a question is by adding a question tag at the end of a sentence. One question tag in English, for example, is right? Something something statement, right? It works in exactly the same way in Spanish. Juan lee libros, no? Juan reads books, doesn't he? The final way to make a sentence in Spanish is to actually switch the verb and the subject. So statements in Spanish would normally be SVO, but to formulate a question, it'll be VSO. The verb and subject are switched. Lee Juan libros? Meaning, does Juan read books? All of these questions mean the same thing, but they're not completely identical. There are tiny nuances that go along with the method you use to formulate a question. The first and last examples appear to have exactly the same meaning, but Juan lee libros places a greater emphasis on Juan because the subject appears first in the sentence, as opposed to Lee Juan libros, where the emphasis is on the verb. As you can see, there are many ways to form basic questions in Spanish. In this lesson, you learned about the word order of Spanish, how to form affirmative and negative sentences, about the omission of the subject, and how to form questions. We've covered only the very basics of Spanish grammar. If you're interested in learning more, check out our Spanish in 3 Minutes video series. In that course, we teach you useful phrases while covering the fundamentals of Spanish grammar, and each lesson is only 3 minutes long. In the next lesson, we'll introduce you to the basics of Spanish writing. See you in the next lesson. Bye. Bye. Want to speak real Spanish from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at SpanishPod101.com. Hi, everybody. Rosa here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Spanish questions. The question for this lesson is, how can I decide if I have to write B or V in Spanish? In Spanish, the letter B and the letter V have the same sound, but they are written differently. So how do you know which one to use? Despite some exceptions, there are some rules that can help you to pick which letter to use. Let's start with B. The words that usually use B can be divided in four groups. First, all the words that begin with bu, bien or bene, and bi. For example, butaca, meaning armchair, bienestar, meaning wellness, and bisonte, bison. Second, all the words that end in bilidad, bundo or bunda. For example, amabilidad, kindness, moribundo, moribund, and nauseabunda, nauseating. Third, all the verbs whose infinitive forms end with ver, bir, and bui. For example, beber, to drink, saber, to know, and escribir, to write. Fourth and last, all of the past imperfect verbs whose first conjugation ends in aba. For example, compraba, I was buying, or cantaba, I was singing. Now let's see the rules for V. 
the words that usually use V can be divided in four groups. First, all the words that begin with V, div, F. For example, vivir, to live, divertido, funny, and evento, event. Second, all the forms in present indicative, imperative, and subjunctive of the verb ir, to go. For example, voy, I go, or ve, you go, in the imperative. Third, all the adjectives that end in ave, avo, evo, and ivo. For example, suave, soft, and decisivo, decisive. Fourth and last, after B, D, N, or all. For example, obviar, to obviate, advertir, to warn, enviar, to send, olvidar, to forget. And that's it. But as you might already know, Spanish always has tricky exceptions. But don't worry, you'll get used to them in no time. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Hasta pronto, see you soon! Hi everybody, Rosa here. Welcome to Asa Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Spanish questions. The question for this lesson is, what are diminutives and how do you use them in Spanish? Appreciative suffixes are added to the end of a word to express an emoji or affective appreciation or to show an opinion. They are classified into three types. Diminutives, augmentatives and peyoratives. In this lesson, we'll discuss the diminutives. ¡Vamos allá! ¡Let's go! Diminutives are used to emphasize that something is particularly small or short. They are also used to express love and affection. Let's go through some examples so you can learn how to use diminutives correctly. A very common one is ito or ita. For example, from the word escalera, stairs, we have escalerita, if we want to express that the stairs are small. Another example from gato, cat. We get the word gatito, adding tenderness to our expression. You can even use this with names such as Juan to Juanito, when you are talking about someone colloquially, most likely a child. Another common suffix, particularly in Andalucía, the southern Spain, is illo or illa. From libro, book, we get librillo, small book. We also have the suffix ete or eta, used more informally. In this case, from amigo, friend, we have amiguete, to express tenderness or affection for our friend. Lastly, with more local use, particularly found in Galicia, northern Spain, we find the suffix iño or iña. From pobre, poor, we can say pobriño, also adding a sense of tenderness. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Please leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. See you soon. Welcome to Introduction to Spanish. My name is Alicia and I'm joined by... Hi everyone, I'm Leah. In this lesson, you'll learn the basics of Spanish grammar. Word order refers to the order in which words are structured to form a sentence in a given language. Consider the English sentence, I read books. If we break down the English sentence, I read books, we can see that the subject, I, is presented first, followed by the verb, read, and then finally the object, books, is positioned last. The basic word order for English, then, is subject, verb, object, or SVO for short. Now, let's compare that same sentence, I read books, in Spanish. Yo leo libros. If we break down the Spanish sentence, we get the subject, yo, meaning I, then comes the verb, leo, meaning read, and finally we have the object, libros, meaning books. The word order for basic Spanish, then, is subject, verb, object, or SVO for short. 
As you can see, the word order for sentences in Spanish is the same as that of English. This means that you can essentially swap out English words for Spanish words in an English sentence to convert it to Spanish. So imagine you wanted to say, I ate an apple, but in Spanish. Just swap out the words. I in Spanish is yo. Ate in Spanish is comí. An is una, and apple is manzana. Altogether, it's yo comí una manzana. So, I ate an apple in Spanish is... Yo comí una manzana. You can form nearly all basic sentences in Spanish just by following the SVO word order. We just saw how easy it was to form basic sentences in Spanish and how similar it was to forming basic English sentences. Luckily, it's actually even easier to form sentences in Spanish than it is in English. That's because Spanish is much more flexible when it comes to word order compared to English. Let's go back to the two examples we used earlier. More often than not, if we wanted to say, I read books and I ate an apple in Spanish, we would not usually say, Yo leo libros. Yo comí una manzana. But instead, we would just say, Leo libros. Comí una manzana. Notice how the subject I is omitted from the sentence. This is how most Spanish sentences are constructed and spoken in real life. When it's clear who or what the subject is, most Spanish speakers would omit the subject altogether. Yo leo libros and yo comí una manzana would only be used if the subject is unclear or if you wanted to place a stronger emphasis on the subject, as if to say, I am the one who reads books or I was the one who ate the apple. So, most of the time, we can actually express any simple action in Spanish with just two words, the verb and the object in Spanish. So far, we've only looked at affirmative sentences in Spanish. But what if you wanted to make the sentence negative? Well, that's very easy as well. All you have to do is just add no before the verb and that's it. So, I don't read books would be... No leo libros. Same thing for I didn't eat an apple. Just add no before the verb. No comí una manzana. And that's all there is to it. Once again, it's much simpler to form questions in Spanish than it is in English. There's actually a variety of different methods of forming a question in Spanish. Let's go through some of them. We'll seem a little strange if we ask our own selves a question in Spanish. So let's introduce a new subject. Let's go with Juan, a very typical Spanish name. So instead of I read books, we now have Juan reads books. Juan lee libros. The simplest way we can turn that statement into a question is by just raising our intonation at the end of the sentence. Juan lee libros? Meaning, does Juan read books? In conversation, we just need to raise the intonation at the end to express that it's a question. In writing, however, we have to include the question mark at the end, just like in English. But unlike English, questions in Spanish are marked with an inverted question mark at the beginning of the question as well. Juan lee libros? Another simple way we can turn a statement into a question is by adding a question tag at the end of a sentence. One question tag in English, for example, is, right? Something something statement, right? It works in exactly the same way in Spanish. Juan lee libros, no? Juan reads books, doesn't he? The final way to make a sentence in Spanish is to actually switch the verb and the subject. So statements in Spanish would normally be SVO, but to formulate a question, it'll be VSO. The verb and subject are switched. Lee Juan libros? Meaning, does Juan read books? All of these questions mean the same thing, but they're not completely identical. There are tiny nuances that go along with the method you use to formulate a question. The first and last examples appear to have exactly the same meaning, but Juan lee libros places a greater emphasis on Juan because the subject appears first in the sentence, as opposed to Lee Juan libros, where the emphasis is on the verb. As you can see, there are many ways to form basic questions in Spanish. In this lesson, you learned about the word order of Spanish, how to form affirmative and negative sentences, about the omission of the subject, and how to form questions. Hi everybody, Rosa here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Spanish questions. The question for this lesson is, what are augmentatives and how do you use them in Spanish? In another lesson, we talk about diminutives which are expressive suffixes used to emphasize that something is particularly small or short, or to show affection. 
In this lesson, we'll discuss augmentatives. Augmentatives are expressive suffixes that emphasize that something is big or has great importance. We'll talk about the most common ones in this lesson. Let's do some examples so you can learn how to use augmentatives correctly. On or ona are common augmentative suffixes and they are used with words like cabeza, meaning head, to make cabezón, a big head. Note that sometimes this is used in a bad or mocking sense. For example, from barriga, belly, we get barrigón, a big belly. Another commonly used suffix is azo or aza. From éxito, success, we get exitazo, to express that something was a great success or a big success. Sometimes, when the word is combined with a tool or utensil, it explains an action that was performed with that tool. For example, bastón, stick, becomes bastonazo and means to hit with a stick. The same happens with pelota, ball, becoming pelotazo, to hit with a ball. Lastly, the suffix ote or ota is commonly used with names and adjectives that apply to people. It's also used for making things seem bigger. However, this one can have a more affectionate sense or can be a soft way of making fun of someone. However, it always depends on the intention of the speaker. For example, from muchacho, boy, to muchachote, literally meaning big boy, and with amigo, friend, we get amigote. This could be used by, for example, your father in a kind way or to make a joke. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Please leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Hasta luego, see you soon. Hi, my name is Rosa and today we will be doing the top 25 phrases in Spanish. So the first one is, hola, hello. Hola, which means hello. Hola is a very casual way to greet someone. So you can say hola to your friends and hola to your family and hola to everyone. <laughs> Adios, goodbye. Adios is goodbye. I don't know why, but to me, adios sounds a bit harsh. So I don't really like saying adios. It sounds like you're not going to see that person again, maybe. <laughs> so instead of adios, I would maybe use hasta luego, which is see you later. Buenos dias, good morning. The next one is buenos dias, which is good morning. Yep, you say it when you see someone in the morning. <laughs> so, <sighs> buenos dias. <laughs> Buenas tardes, good afternoon. Buenas tardes, which is good afternoon. Buenas tardes is used uh, from 12 p.m. on. So yeah, maybe you are having lunch and you see someone, so you say, Buenas tardes. <laughs> Buenas noches, good night. The next one is Buenas noches, which means good night. Say like goodbye. When you are going to sleep, you say Buenas noches. Is the last thing you say. Buenas noches. Sí, yes. The next phrase is sí which means yes. <laughs> For example, if someone asked me, do you want a slice of cheesecake? I would say, sí. No, no. Uh, the next phrase is no, which means no. <laughs> For example, do you want to do your homework? No. Nos vemos. See you later. Uh, the next one is nos vemos, which is see you later. Very casual. So yeah, you can say it to your friends or yeah, to your family, whatever, when you want to say, like, goodbye, see you soon. <laughs> hasta mañana, see you tomorrow. The next one is hasta mañana, which means see you tomorrow. For example, if you are mm, at the university and you want to uh, say goodbye to your friends, which you won't be seeing until tomorrow, you would say hasta mañana. ¿Cuál es tu nombre? What is your name? So the next phrase is ¿Cuál es tu nombre? Uh, which means, what is your name? Uh, mi nombre es Rosa. And yep, yeah, what is your name? Tell me. <laughs> yo soy Rosa. I am Rosa. The next phrase is, yo soy plus your name. So in my case, yo soy Rosa. 
and it means I am Rosa. What's your name? Encantado de conocerle. Nice to meet you. The next phrase is encantado de conocerle, which is nice to meet you. But the thing is that encantado de conocerle uh, is a bit formal. So if you want to say to your friends or I don't know family, uh, you could say encantado de conocerte. Encantado de conocerte. <laughs> Gracias. Thank you. The next phrase is gracias, which is thank you. If you want to say thank you very much, you would say eh, muchas gracias. Thank you for watching this video. Eh, gracias por ver este video. Thank you. De nada. You're welcome. And the next phrase is de nada, eh, which means you're welcome. So yeah, whenever someone says thank you to you, make sure to say de nada. <laughs> no hay de qué. Don't mention it. The next phrase is no hay de qué. Don't mention it. So if you do a favor to someone and that someone says thank you to you, gracias, uh, you could say, no hay de qué. <laughs> por favor, please. The next one is por favor, which means please. So if you want to ask for a favor uh, to someone, you would say, por favor. <laughs> por favor, suscribiros a este canal. <laughs> please subscribe to this channel. <laughs> Perdón. Sorry. The next one is perdón. <laughs> which is sorry. If you haven't heard something properly and you want the other person to repeat it, you can say, perdón. <laughs> lo siento. Sorry. The next one is, lo siento. I'm sorry. So if you did something wrong, uh, that's what you say. So, for example, if you get late to class, uh, you could say to the, to the teacher, lo siento. <laughs> Bienvenidos. Welcome. <laughs> the next one is, bienvenidos, which is welcome. Bienvenido. <laughs> if someone is coming to your house, you can say, Bienvenidos. <laughs> ¿Cómo estás? How are you? The next one is, ¿Cómo estás? Which means, how are you? It's not a formal uh, way to say it, but maybe a more informal way would be, ¿Qué tal? But yeah, I think you can use, ¿Cómo estás? Like, with almost everyone. Like, sometimes when you ask, ¿Cómo estás? Uh, you want, like, a more in-depth answer, like you don't want a simple, I'm fine, but you really want to know how that person is. But maybe, ¿qué tal? is more casual, and it's just like, you just want to hear, I'm fine, <laughs> thank you. For example, if you ask someone, ¿cómo estás? That person could tell you, I'm not very good, I lost my job and I'm trying to find a new one, but mm, something like that. ¿Qué hora es? What time is it? The next one is ¿Qué hora es? Mm, what time is it? Uh, so now it's four o'clock, eh, las cuatro en punto. ¿Cuánto es? How much? The next one is ¿Cuánto es? Uh, how much? So when you enter a shop and you want to know the price of something, you can say ¿Cuánto es? Also you can say ¿Cuánto cuesta? Is the same thing. ¿Qué es eso? What is that? The next one is ¿Qué es eso? What is that? <laughs> yeah, you can point at something and ask ¿Qué es eso? <laughs> ¿En dónde está el baño? Where is the bathroom? The next one is ¿En dónde está el baño? Uh, where is the bathroom? Yeah, very useful <laughs> phrase to know. So, for example, if you are in a restaurant and you want to go to the bathroom, you can ask the waiter, ¿Dónde está el baño? And then the waiter indicates you and yeah, you go to the bathroom. <laughs> no lo comprendo. I don't understand. The next one is, no lo comprendo, which is, I don't understand it. If someone is talking to you and um, you are a bit lost, you can say, lo siento, sorry, eh, no lo comprendo, I don't understand. If they are nice, they will try to explain it better to you. <laughs> also, eh, instead of comprendo, you can also say entiendo. So, eh, no lo entiendo, it would be the same thing. This is the end. Uh, thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed these top 25 phrases in Spanish and don't forget to subscribe. Bye. I am a bit shy. I don't know. I don't know. Hi everybody, Rosa here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Spanish questions. The question for this lesson is, what are pejoratives and how do you use them in Spanish?
In previous lessons, we discussed diminutives and augmentatives, and in this lesson, we'll discuss pejoratives. You may already know diminutives make something smaller or affectionate, and augmentatives make something bigger or important. So, what do pejoratives do? Pejoratives are used to emphasize something negative. We'll go over the most common ones in this lesson. Let's go over some examples so you can learn how to use pejoratives correctly. A common pejorative suffix is ucho or ucha. For example, from flaco, slim or thin, we get flacucho. When used in a pejorative sense, it means very slim, as in almost sick. Another example would be for the adjective devil, weak, we get debilucha, used to describe a woman who is physically or psychologically weak. Another pejorative suffix is acho or acha. For example, pueblo from the Latin populus, meaning people, becomes populazzo, meaning common people or mob. By adding the suffix acho, the speaker shows less consideration for the original meaning of people. Another example would be from pueblo, town, which becomes poblazo, meaning dirty town or destroyed town. Here's an example sentence. El populazo cree que puede ganar en las elecciones. It means, the common people think that they can win the elections. Usually, people use these suffixes to gossip or to look down on others. You don't always use the same suffixes for every word, as each word is used mostly with just one suffix. So make sure you check with suffix to use before you use it. Here, we have other less common pejorative suffixes, like ejo or eja, changing tipo, meaning guy, to tipejo, bad guy, Calle, meaning road, to calleja, narrow road. Or uzo or uza, from gente, meaning people, we get gentuza, bad people. All of these examples are used pejoratively. Lastly is ato or ata. You could use this for the word niño, boy, and get niñato, brat. Be careful with this word because it has a really bad meaning and can be considered an insult as well. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Hasta luego, until next time! Hi everybody, Rosa here, welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Spanish questions. The question for this lesson is, how do I use Spanish punctuation? Just like in English, punctuation marks are used to provide emphasis to indicate pauses and intonation changes and to guide people through the meaning of our expressions. Let's take a look to the basic uses of punctuation marks in Spanish. The first one is el punto. This literally means the dot. But you may know it better as the period in American English or full stop in British English. It's used to mark the ending of a sentence or complete thought. After using a punto, the next word should be capitalized. For example, Juan viene hoy. Mis amigos vendrán mañana. This means, Juan is coming today. My friends will come tomorrow. Next, we have la coma or the coma. This indicates a short pause in a sentence, and its usage is similar to English. For example, Viajaré por Andalucía, Zaragoza y Toledo, meaning I will travel to Andalucía, Zaragoza and Toledo. This one sounds different from the English version. El punto y coma. This literally means the dot and coma but you may know it better as the semicolon. It's used to divide related sections in a single sentence. For example, Hoy veremos un buen partido. Sin embargo, creo que mi equipo perderá. Meaning, Today we will see a good match. However, 
I think my team will lose. We can also use the punto y coma in a longer sentence that already has comas. For example, Ana fue al museo, Carlos a la biblioteca y David a la universidad. Meaning, Ana went to the museum, Carlos to the library, and David to the university. Unlike the punto or coma, the punto y coma really depends on the writer's discretion. As a general rule, use the punto y coma if you feel the two sentences are closely related enough to make them into one sentence. After a punto y coma, you always have a lowercase letter. Let's move on to two more punctuation marks you may be familiar with, the signos de interrogación and exclamación. The signos de interrogación is better known in English as the question mark and is used in interrogative sentences. The exclamación sounds similar to the English exclamation point and works the same way. It's used to express surprise, anger, or any other strong emotions. Remember that in Spanish, you could write an inverted question mark or exclamation mark at the beginning of the sentence in addition to the mark at the end. Some examples are ¿Qué hora es? What time is it? ¿Cómo te llamas? What's your name? ¡Socorro! ¡Help! And ¡Vamos! ¡Let's go! Finally, the colon, which is dos puntos, ellipsis, which is puntos suspensivos, parenthesis, which is parenthesis, and comillas, which is quotation marks, are used the same way in English as in Spanish. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Please leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Hasta la próxima, until next time. Hi everybody, Rosa here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Spanish questions. The question for this lesson is, why do some Spanish adjectives and words have a shortened form? Some Spanish adjectives have a shortened form. We call this form apocope, or in English, apocope. This means the suppression of some sounds in the final part of a word. Most adjectives lose their last vowel, for example, o, when they are placed before a singular masculine noun. Sound confusing? Don't worry, there are only a few types of these adjectives in Spanish. Most of them are commonly used and will be easy for you to remember. Here they are. Bueno, meaning good, becomes buen. Malo, meaning bad, becomes mal. Alguno, meaning some, becomes algún. Ninguno, meaning no, becomes ningún. And grande, meaning big, becomes gran. Let's go through some examples so you can learn how to use the shortened forms of these Spanish adjectives. First up, he comprado un buen libro. I bought a good book. In this sentence, the word bueno, meaning good, gets shortened to buen because it was placed before the masculine singular noun libro, meaning book. Another example would be Estoy teniendo un mal año, meaning I'm having a bad year. Again, in this sentence, the word malo, bad, becomes mal because it's placed before the masculine singular noun, año, meaning year. You can also see this short-term form with ordinal and numeral adjectives like primero, first, becomes primer, and tercero, third, becomes tercer. With numeral, it sounds like this. Uno, meaning one, becomes un. And ciento, meaning hundred, becomes cien. Let's go through some more examples. He escrito mi primer libro. Literally meaning, I had written my first book. Again, we have the masculine singular noun, libro, book, 
So primero, meaning first, gets shortened to primer. Another example would be Tengo un perro pequeño. I have a little dog. Here, the word perro, dog, is in its singular masculine form. So uno, one, gets shortened to un. Remember that these adjectives only lose the final vowel when they are placed before a singular masculine noun. If placed after the noun or if the noun is feminine, their vowel will remain intact. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Please leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Hasta luego, see you later! Hi everybody, Rosa here. Welcome to Asa Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Spanish questions. The question for this lesson is How do I use the pronoun SE as an indirect object? SE creates a lot of confusion for students because there are several uses and functions for SE in Spanish. In this lesson, we'll see SE used as a third-person pronoun functioning as an indirect object. This means that we'll use SE when it means a él or a ella, for him or for her, and a ellos or a ellas, both meaning for them. First, let's remember that in Spanish you can say a él or a ella using the particle le, and a ellos or a ellas using the particle les. Instead of a, you can also use para. Le and les are indirect objects. And to recognize them, we have to see to whom the action of the verb goes. Like, for example, in this sentence, Marta compró un regalo para su novio, meaning Marta bought a present for her boyfriend. We can also say Marta le compró un regalo, meaning Marta bought him a present. The personal pronoun se as an indirect object is used instead of le or less when se comes before one of the pronouns lo, la, los or las when they are acting as direct objects. Let's do some examples so you can learn how to use se as an indirect object correctly. From the sentence le di las llaves meaning I gave him the keys you can say se las di meaning I gave them to him. Here, se replaces the indirect object, le, and la replaces the direct object, the keys. From les compré un libro, I bought them a book, we get se lo compré, I bought it for them. Here, se replaces the indirect object, les, before the direct object, lo. Let's do one more example. Abrí la puerta a la profesora. I open the door for the teacher. La puerta, the door, is the direct object as it's the thing that we open. And a la profesora, literally meaning for the teacher, is the indirect object because it's the person to whom the action goes. So using the pronouns, it would become se la abrí, meaning I opened it for her. Se is for her and la is the door. This way we can refer to the things or people we've already talked about without having to repeat them. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Please leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. See you later! Hasta luego! Hi everybody, Rosa here. Welcome to Asa Teacher where I'll answer some of your most common Spanish questions. The question for this lesson is how can I use the pronoun SE reciprocally? In this lesson, we are going to focus on another common and important usage of the pronoun SE. Ok, let's go! We can see the reciprocal pronoun SE when we have two or more subjects who are doing the same action to each other. Here, SE would function as the direct object but will be the indirect object if there's another direct object that is formally expressed. Let's take, for example, Carlos y Juan se pelean, meaning Carlos and Juan fight with each other. 
here say acts as the direct object because the thing that they are fighting is themselves. Another example would be Los amigos se escriben cartas, literally meaning the friends write letters among them. Here, the direct object is cartas, letters, which is the thing that they are writing, and C acts as the indirect object as it's to whom the action goes. A helpful tip to identify this kind of C is to add el uno al otro, meaning to each other, el uno con el otro, literally meaning one with the other, mutuamente, meaning mutually, or reciprocamente, meaning reciprocally to the end of the sentence. If the sentence's meaning doesn't change, we need to use reciprocal C. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Please leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. See you later! Hi everybody, I'm Rosa. Welcome to As a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Spanish questions. The question for this lesson is what are the main differences between Spanish from Spain, Latin America, and the Caribbean? Spanish is one of the world's most widely spoken languages. It's the official language in 19 countries, as well as in Puerto Rico. It's so widespread because of Spanish colonial history. During the colonial period, Spanish mixed with native regional languages, and that's why Spanish is so different around the world. There's no standard Spanish dialect, only regional dialects, so it's common for Spanish learners to run into different kinds of Spanish, especially in terms of pronunciation. In the US, Latin American Spanish is what's most commonly taught in schools. It's spoken in most of Central America and South America, including Mexico, and excluding Argentina, Brazil, Suriname, French Guiana, and Guyana. Latin American Spanish has strong R's and a relatively clean pronunciation. Words are pronounced mostly as they are written. Here are just a few regional varieties of Latin American Spanish. Caribbean Spanish often drops S's at the end of the words, making it sound a lot faster than Spanish from other countries. Mexican Spanish takes a lot of vocabulary from the indigenous language Nahuatl. You may be familiar with the word Chocolate, which comes from the word chocolate in Nahuatl. Also, the double L in Mexico has a Y sound. So, my name is Ricardo, is me llamo Ricardo. Colombian Ecuadorian Spanish is a mixture of Caribbean Spanish and Coastal Spanish. Uh, here, the double L uh, usually sounds like a J, uh, like uh, me llamo Ricardo. Argentinian Spanish is, a, is in a category by itself. It's very different from the Spanish spoken in the rest of Latin American countries. It has some indigenous Guarani vocabulary, but also French and Italian immigrants uh, strongly influence this dialect. An interesting fact about Argentinian Spanish is that Argentinian slang, called Lunfardo, was originally a made-up prison language. Prisoners, mostly Italian, used this so guards couldn't understand what they were saying. Uh, now, Lunfardo words are used all over Argentina. Argentinian Spanish also uses vos, uh, the formal U address, instead of tu, the more common informal address in Latin America. Uh, the double L is pronounced like uh, J or Z, H, like in Me llamo Ricardo. Spanish in Spain is called Castilian Spanish. Some pronunciations are very different than the other kinds of Spanish we've already mentioned. The double L is pronounced differently depending on the region within Spain. The Latin American CC is pronounced with a TH and sound like C, C. For example, gracias, meaning thank you, is pronounced uh, gracias. <laughs> in Latin American Spanish and gracias in Castilian Spanish. Another major difference is that Cat Castilian Spanish often uses the plural form vosotros instead of uh, the form ustedes, which is used in Latin America. Pretty fascinating, isn't it? If you have any other questions, leave a comment and I'll try to answer them. Ciao! 
Hello everybody, Rosa here. Welcome to As a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Spanish questions. The question for this lesson is, how can you tell if a noun is masculine or feminine? In Spanish, every noun has a gender. That applies to plural nouns too. Other Romance languages have masculine and feminine nouns too. It's a trait that comes from Latin, and the gender can depend on its origin in an older Latin word. English doesn't have masculine or feminine nouns, so the easiest way to tell the gender of a noun is to take a look at the last letter of a noun. The general rule is that if a noun ends in A, it is feminine. For example, la manzana, the apple, la ventana, the window, and la casa, the house. Nouns that end in O are generally masculine. For example, el horno, the oven, el perro, the dog, and el libro, the book. The only thing is, there are a lot of exceptions. For example, um, el mapa, which is the map, even though it ends in A, it is masculine. And el día, meaning the day, which is also masculine. Some other examples are la foto, meaning the photo, which is feminine even though it ends in a no, and la mano, the hand, which is also feminine. Because there are so many exceptions, it's best to learn the nouns with their articles. Uh, these are B and A in English. For Spanish, it would be L or UN in mas for masculine words, and LA or UNA for feminine words. However, O and A are not the only indicators for masculine and feminine words. Here are a few others. Nouns that end in E, MA, or an accented vowel such as I are often masculine. For example, el perfume, the perfume, el programa, the program, el colibrí, the hummingbird, are all masculine. On the other hand, nouns that end in D, Z or yon are normally feminine. For example, la felicidad, the happiness, la nariz, the nose, and la religión, the religion, are feminine. It's important to remember what gender a noun is because it sometimes influences other parts of the sentence. They modify. Adjectives in particular change their spelling according to the gender of the nouns they modify. It goes a bit like this. A notebook, un cuaderno, is masculine. So to say a red notebook, you could say un cuaderno rojo. An apple, una manzana, is feminine. So a red apple could be una manzana roja, with rojo changing to roja ending with an A. I hope that answers the questions. If uh, I hope that answers the questions. If you have any more questions, please let them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Hi everybody, Rosa here. Welcome to Asa Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Spanish questions. The question for this lesson is when do we use por qué, por qué, por qué, and por qué? Por qué, por qué, por qué, por qué, separated, together, with an accent, without an accent. What's the difference? In this lesson, we'll teach you how to choose the right one. Let's start with por qué. All one word with an accent over the E. This is a masculine substantive meaning cause, motive, or reason. Normally, an article precedes it. An example would be No quiero saber el por qué. In this case, the meaning is I don't want to know the cause, motive or reason. It also has the plural form los porqués. Next, let's move on to por qué. Separated with an accent over the e. This phrase is used to ask about the cause, the reason or motive of something. It is comprised of the preposition POR and the interrogative pronoun QUE. 
the accent mark distinguishes it from the relative conjunction que. In this case, por qué functions as why. For example, por qué no has llegado antes, meaning why didn't you come earlier? Here, we are asking what the cause or reason is for why the person didn't come sooner. To answer the question, por qué, we often use our next word, por qué. All one word and no accent over the e. It's a conjunction used to introduce subordinate sentences that express cause. For example, no pude venir más temprano porque he perdido el tren, meaning I couldn't come before because I lost the train. In this case, porque functions as because. Our last one is porque, separated and no accent over the e. There are two grammatical uses for this one. The first use is the preposition por plus the relative pronoun que. For example, son varios los motivos por que te llamo. Literally, there are various reasons for which I call you. Sometimes you can find an article between por and que. Por el que, por la que, por los que, or por las que. Usually it means for which. In the second use, it's comprised of the preposition por plus the subordinating conjunction que. We find it when we have specific verbs that require the preposition por. For example, estoy contento porque vengas a visitarme. Literally translated as I'm happy for that you are going to visit me. So remember, por qué, the reason, is a noun. Por qué, why, makes questions. Por qué, because, answers questions. And por qué, for which or verbs that require por. How was it? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Hi everybody, Rosa here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Spanish questions. The question for this lesson is, when are the prepositions por and para used? The prepositions por and para are a little difficult for Spanish mm -hmm. learners, because both are used in similar contexts and have similar meanings. In English, the prepositions por and para are frequently translated as for, by, and to. Let's go over por and para so you can learn how to use them correctly. Por comes from the Latin word pro, meaning for, while para is formed from the combination of the Latin prepositions pro and ad, which mean for and to respectively. Por is frequently used to express a cause, such as viajo por placer, meaning I travel for pleasure, a place, such as camino por la calle, meaning I walk down the street. A period of time, por las mañanas voy a la universidad. In the morning, I go to college. A medium, te enviaré el paquete por mensajero. I'll send the package by courier. A substitution or equivalence, haré los deberes por ti. I will do the task for you. En passive voice. El almuerzo fue preparado por mi madre. Lunch was prepared by my mother. Para is used for. Utility. Estas zapatillas son para correr. Meaning, these shoes are for running. Direction. Voy para Europa en vacaciones. I'm going to Europe on vacation. Here, it can be replaced by con destino a, which means bound for. Time limitation, son 10 para las 5, it's 10 minutes to 5. Here, the difference is that we use para when time is fixed 
or when there's a deadline. Opinion. Para mí, que perderán el juego. I think that they will lose the game. Literally, for me, that they will lose the game. And go or destination. To where or to whom it goes. As in, saldré a caminar para respirar aire fresco. Meaning, I will go for a walk to get some fresh air. Here, the goal is to get fresh air. The most challenging point may be to identify when to use por instead of para. Just keep in mind that por is used more frequently to talk about a medium to do something. As in, te llamaré por teléfono, I will call you by phone. Another common usage is to refer to something unspecific, either time or place. For example, estoy por tu casa, meaning I'm around close to your house, or llegaré por la tarde, meaning I will arrive around the afternoon. Para, on the other hand, is more often used to talk about the purpose or destination of something, as in este libro es para la clase, meaning this book is for the class, or Voy para tu casa, meaning I'm going to or in direction to your house. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Hasta luego, see you later. Hi everybody, Rosa here. Welcome to As a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Spanish questions. The question for this lesson is, when do you use the conjunction E instead of E. First, let's go over some background information on how to use E. E is a conjunction in Spanish that means and. It's a conjunción coordinada copulativa or copulative coordinating conjunction. It's used to connect words or sentences. An example with words would be He estudiado historia y literatura meaning, I've studied history and literature. Here, the words historia, history, and literatura, literature, are connected with the word e, and. An example with sentences would be, El sábado iré a Madrid, y el domingo quiero ir al Museo del Prado. Meaning, on Saturday, I will go to Madrid, and on Sunday, I want to go to the Prado Museum. Here, E, meaning and, is used to connect both weekend activities. Now, on to the question for this lesson. When the word E precedes a word that begins with an E sound, it changes to E. This includes H and I together because H is silent in Spanish. Let's go through some examples so you can learn when to use E instead of E. Mañana quiero levantarme temprano e ir de compras means Tomorrow I want to get up early and go shopping. Here the verb ir meaning to go begins with an E. Therefore E changes to E. Let's do one more example. Son hermanos pero parecen padre e hijo. They are brothers, but they look like father and son. Here, the word hijo, son, is spelled H-I, but has an E sound. Therefore, E changes to E. A good thing to remember is words that have been borrowed from other languages such as English and maintain their original pronunciation also require E to change. Like in this example, me pidió dirección e email, meaning he asked for my direction and email. This is because the word email has an e sound. Now here's the tricky part. If the word begins with i or hi but doesn't make an e sound, then you don't have to use e instead of e. For example, 
words that have an initial diphthong like coge la olla y hierve las verduras, meaning pick the pot and boil the vegetables, don't need e to change as the sound is different than e. So why do the words change? That's easy, because it's easier to pronounce. How was this lesson? Pretty interesting, right? Do you have any more questions? Leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them. Hi everybody, Rosa here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Spanish questions. The question for this lesson is, how do you know when to use ser o estar? This can be confusing for Spanish learners, especially for native English speakers, because both ser and estar mean to be. First, let's go over the forms of ser. I am, yo soy, you are, singular, tú eres, he, she, is, you are, polite, él, ella, usted, es, we are, nosotros somos, you are, plural, vosotros sois, they are, you are, polite and plural, ellos, ellas, ustedes, son. The different form of a star are yo estoy for I am, tú estás for you are, singular, él, ella, usted, está for he, she, is, you are, polite, nosotros estamos for we are, vosotros estáis for you are in polite form, and ellos, ellas, ustedes están for they are, you are, polite and plural. There is a subtle but simple difference between the two words for to be. Está is for temporary conditions such as feelings and emotions, and that's why how are you is como estás. Ser is for characteristics or permanent states of being. For example, if I say I am American, I would say yo soy americano. Here's a good rule of thumb. Turn the sentence into a question. If the question uses how, then use está. And if it uses what, use se. Take the word callado, for example, which means quiet. Depending on which verb you use, the nuance will be different. If you say ella es callada, which uses se, that means uh, she's quiet, as in she's a quiet person. On the other hand, if you say ella está callada, which uses the verb estar, that would mean she is being quiet. The nuance is that this situation is temporary and that she is just being quiet in this moment in time. Pretty cool, right? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment and I'll try to answer them. Bye! Hi everybody, Rosa here. Welcome to Ask a Teacher, where I'll answer some of your most common Spanish questions. The question for this lesson is, what are false friends? There are a lot of words that look similar in English and Spanish, but they don't always mean the same thing. False friends are a great name for them, because they can be a bit deceptive. Here are some of the most common false friends. Beware of this, so you can avoid misunderstanding when uh, speaking Spanish with others. Asistir doesn't mean to help, that is, ayudar. Asistir is to attend. For example, to attend a concert could be asistir a un concierto. Likewise, un asistente is an attendee, and asistencia is attendance. In a more shocking sample, molestar isn't as bad as it sounds, it just means to bother. And you won't find un éxito in a building, éxito means success. For your studies, lectura is another one that is easy to misinterpret. Um, lectura means reading. And a lecture would be una conferencia or una clase. Another example is una carpeta, which is a carpet but a folder. And una librería is actually a bookstore, so don't expect to borrow anything for free. Um, the word for library is biblioteca. And what's how you use actual? Because actual means current. 
Actualmente means currently. Be careful with embarazada too. Um, embarrassed is avergonzado for men and avergonzada for women. Don't use embarazado with a man because it means pregnant. If you see sopa on a restaurant menu, don't be alarmed, it's just soup. If you hear someone say delito though, eh, which may be mistaken for delight, you should be concerned because it's actually crime. Last but not least, constipado can be a bit confusing. As an adjective, it means constipated, but used as a noun, it refers to the common cold. Pretty interesting, right? I hope that answers the questions. If you have any other questions, please leave a comment below and I'll try to answer them. Hasta la próxima! Want to speed up your language learning? Take your very first lesson with us. You'll start speaking in minutes and master real conversations. Sign up for your free lifetime account. Just click the link in the description.